Right. Now That's, what can you see? Now I see the presentation. Right, great, because now I've got it round the wrong way. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. We'll just we'll just go with that. Yeah? Yeah, we'll go with that. As long as you as long as you can see what it is. I see what you're showing, yeah. Yeah. Should we just should we just hit the switch that, and, and it, go for and it? And it's moving. Yeah, that's fine. And um, okay, that's fine. I can see what's coming up on the next screen. That's fine. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Happy with yes. broadcast? Yes. Yeah, go on. Right, yeah, crack it. on. Okay, so how are we doing? Uh, yeah, a couple of guys coming in. I mean, we're, we're always um, a couple of minutes late anyway. S apologies for the slight delay, everybody. Um, it's been a few weeks. Yeah, I'm not even in my own house. Um, I am, but I don't recognize You are. It. <laughs> but, you know, um, things, things were okay. Things were going. Let me just um, I actually double check that the chat works and people can chat to each other and things. Jets there. Oh, there's Jack. Good chats. Alright. Oh, um... Talk about this. Hello, Terry. Alright, so all panelists can talk to each other. And attendees. Right, awesome. Can I pop this out? Yes, I can. Right. Remember how to do all this now. Okay. Alright, guys. Uh, let's. let's... Alright. Let's assume that everybody's here. Now, um, hi Terry, how are you doing? Hi Mark. Hello Sean. I could have said hello to you earlier on, I was just upstairs buddy. Um, right, um, now, we've covered this subject before and there's a recording of it available. But a lot of people wanted an 8 p.m. delivery and we've decided to start doing some more webinars. So we're going to do some webinars of new subjects, new um, new um, ideas. We've got lots to put together. Uh, we've got a couple of new ones already, but we wanted to kind of get back into the flow. So we thought we'd let's let's go back to some older ones. Let's do them at 8 p.m. and also just give the opportunity for you guys to discuss it further. Um, there are a couple of questions from the Discord that we'll try to find some time to approach. Mm -hmm. If you think, do you think we'll get the time to approach those? Yeah, if we sort of rattle through a bit, yeah. We'll rattle through a little bit. All right, so um, obviously I'm joined by my dad here, Phil Watts. Uh, if, if, if any of you guys aren't, don't know who he is, um, he can introduce, introduce himself in a minute. But basically, um, the S7999 is a bit of a, I wouldn't say it's a specialist subject because you cover a lot of other subjects, um, but it's an area that we have a lot of experience in. And we had... Um, some uh, de we developed a qualification with City and Girls didn't you, with us at college, basically. We did, we did, we did. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, do let me know if the audio is uh, up or down, or if you can hear. Maybe, mostly, Phil, I'm going to hand over to Dan in a minute, really. Um, I'm just kind of introducing, but let, 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 let us know and we can see if we can help because again, we, we're just getting back to this, right? Um, I think everyone's in, so <clears throat> shall I hand over to you, Pop? Yeah, crack on. All right. Yep. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be here. I might just mute myself, but um, if you guys want to, there's there's a question and answer tab, or you can just chat away. I'll try to. If I see something that's on point, I can I can speak. If if uh, Phil doesn't see it, but uh, yeah, any anything you know, we may not have all the answers, but we can at least give us give you an opinion. All right. I'll tell you now, David. I've got the chat turned off because it's came up in the middle of my uh, no screen. I've got it here. So it's off at the moment. Yeah, Otherwise you can I pop it see. out and move it, but I've got like yep. Paul's bloody four screens here. So oh, fantastic. It's, it's one of those. I've, I'm, I'm on chat. You just focus on uh, on your on your silly bub. Right here. All right, cool. Okay, so what's this about? This is BS7909. Uh, it's looking at temporary electrical systems. Uh, and this is aimed at people who are working... Uh, in events mainly, um, BS7909 was all to do with uh, a code of practice for temporary electrical systems for entertainment and other purposes. Uh, and that is encompassing an awful lot of different types of 
any event either it could be looking at sporting events we could be looking at uh, music mm -hmm. events pop festivals all sorts of stuff uh, and even things like fates uh, fairgrounds you know all sorts of activities country shows whatever anything where we have a system which is not a permanent fixture and bs7909 is the code of practice for that and effectively um if you're an installation electrician um you may get asked to do temporary systems for people for different events and if you try to install to bs7671 and more importantly to inspect and test to bs7671 you come to a stage where you think hang on this doesn't work so bs7909 was introduced some years ago it's, it's due an update it's past due an update really um and if we install and inspect and test okay we tend to use bs7909 it's a much more useful document and it's much more relevant to temporary systems i'll just add to that i mean we've been done testing to that standard for a number of years now and we've actually started to kind of reflect on our own interpretation of guidance notes three and the way we test in bs7671 um and a, that that learned there's a lot to be learned from the testing requirements of 7909 i think yeah yeah there's uh, certain things that we've found we've found due to our experience in temporary systems and when we transferred that over to fixed installations we found that we were picking up problems in things for things like uh, fault current short circuit current that sort of stuff uh which is an issue with temporary systems because of the length of run uh and then we found that when we started doing that sort of testing in fixed installations even though it's not part of the um scheduler testing uh, when you go by the guidance note three um actually we found we were picking up faults and issues and so yes it's, it's been very useful for that as well so what does uh 7909 apply to well as i said it's a code of practice for temporary systems for entertainment and related purposes and that's a can of worms um when we think about the definitions from 7909 uh, entertainment industry they talk about all branches of theater opera concerts touring music festivals and so forth and so forth and so forth okay staged as live performance for an immediate uh, audience or even filmed or television video or sound recorded material so there's a whole range of stuff in there um, which you know there's all different aspects to that there's all different sort of variables on that so it's quite a wide-ranging topic We talk about temporary electrical systems, okay? And they're careful with their wording. They talk about temporary electrical systems rather than a temporary electrical installation. Uh, 7671 talks about an electrical installation as being a fixed permanent install. That's why 7909 uses the terminology of temporary electrical system rather than the installation. The temporary electrical system contains all your switch gear generators distribution units and so forth cables connectors and everything else which is involved in providing a safe electrical system for the use of the event whilst whilst we were saying the word system i'll remind everybody that um this is all applicable to electric work regulations and that uses the term system as well yeah yeah, I mean, we're all well aware of the electric, uh, electricity at work regs. And remember that the electrical system covers everything from the supply all the way through the disc boards, the cabling, the switch gear, everything right to the pieces of electrical equipment, which are actually finally connected to the system. And all of that has to be safe. All of that has to be taken into consideration. So we're looking at a huge range of things. There's a picture there of Royal Ascot, which are... Uh, rather poignant it today like this week, does it? yeah it doesn't look like that today <laughs> um, <laughs> looks rather empty today but um the racing still went ahead um i did have a couple of calls from from there they had a, a couple of issues but um yeah no it's um as i say at the moment we're in this situation we've got uh racing has recently just started again we've got football kicking off tomorrow so i'm sure a lot of you guys will be pleased about that um I, I don't mind the football. I'm more of a rugby guy, so I'm waiting for that to come. I think that's coming in August. Uh, yeah, we're gradually getting back to some sort of semblance of normality. But at the moment, we've mm. got situations where obviously all the pop festivals and stuff, like Glastonbury shown there, 
they're, they're just not happening. So, um, you know, gradually the event industry will grind back into motion, but it's not going to happen for a few months, I don't think. But uh, these are the It'll sort of things. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Um, these are the sort of things that so we're providing temporary electrical systems for. These are the larger events, but obviously it can be very small events as well. Maybe a school fate where you might just be putting the extension lead I'm out. Glad, I'm glad you actually mentioned that. System. It's, it's, very, it's very easy to just put this into the sports or the movies or the theatre production area, but small businesses might run events or fates, little yep. festival things, little village fates. All of that is a system that's been put in for a temporary purpose to mm. entertain the public. Uh, yeah. Christmas time, you know, the markets and things. Yeah, <laughs> it needs to be safely designed, safely monitored, safely controlled. It's all within its scope. Anything it, extension? Put an extension lead out for something like a PA system. Uh, it's a temporary system, mm. so it needs to be put put in properly. It needs to be signed off. It needs to be documented. Um, so that we are covering ourselves. This is the issue with certification and documentation. It's there to protect us more than anything. Um, make sure we document all the systems that we put in. So are these systems not suitably covered by BS 7671? Well, obviously it's an electrical system and it has to be uh, applicable to BS 7671 in many ways. Um, and we use BS 7671 when we're looking at things like automatic disconnection, RCD protection, types of cables, cable runs, uh, switch gear. There's so many issues that come up with, you know, calculating maximum demand, calculating load current, all those sorts mm. of things, all covered, earthing and bonding, all covered to an extent by BS 7671. But there are special um, situations with temporary systems where we need some additional information. Okay, rather like in BS 7671, we've got the special locations and special installations at the end in Appendix 7. Okay, BS 7909 is the additional document to go to when we're That's looking at temporary it's, electrical it's, systems. It's the additional point when you've actually kind of dried up your requirements of, of 7671, mm. you know anybody who goes into this area if they just study 7909 that's not enough no. you know 7671 is your foundation and then 7909 has that extra supplementary requirements yeah and as it states in bs 7671 in chat in part one it says that the regulations may need to be supplemented um by the requirements of other British or harmonised standards. We talk about fire alarm systems. We talk about emergency lighting, BS5266. Now, we, we cover emergency lighting to an extent in BS7671 where we're looking at the type of cabling, the type of protection and everything else. But what BS7671 doesn't tell you for emergency lighting is what's your lumen requirement, where to actually put these things. Now, what the location is, the actual inspection and testing regime for emergency lighting, all of that is in BS 5266. So for temporary events, we have this additional document, this code of practice, BS 7909, to cover all the temporary electrical systems. The BS 7671 defines a temporary system or temporary installation they use. Yeah, uh, electrical installation erected for a particular purpose and dismantled when no longer required for that purpose. There is no time limit set. And this is one of the common questions that I get asked <laughs> how is how long is temporary? Well, yeah, we've known temporary electrical systems that have been in for a number of years. Or intended um, temporaries that just yeah. kind of be neglected and forgotten. Yeah, well, we might need that again or we'll yeah. leave that in. And uh, yeah, it comes a period of time where you just have to say, well, hang on. We have to take a common sense approach to this. And if you want this as a permanent thing, it needs to be done properly. But effectively, a temporary system is one that is pulled out when it is no longer required for that purpose. Okay. Um, yeah. You may have a situation, you may have a system like we do with some, some of the events we, we go to where they might actually put a system in in um, April and it comes out in October. Okay. So what do we do about that? Well, it's a temporary system. We install it to BS7671 and BS7909. We do the inspection and testing to BS7909. But what we will do is we will go back and re-inspect after a certain amount of time. Okay. Generally, with a temporary system, when we do the inspection, 
and testing after the installation, we're looking at a finite period of time before that installation is going to be uh, need to be required to be tested and inspected again. Remember with temporary electrical systems, quite often there's quite a lot of dynamic stuff going on. Things are getting moved, things are getting added, things are changing. If there's any significant changes, any significant addition, then it will need to be inspected and tested again. But uh, generally, a temporary system is one that is put in for a particular purpose and then pulled out again. That's what BS7671 does. It covers the fundamental principles, protection, safety, selection, erection, etc. But it doesn't cover the nitty gritty of the temporary system. It does have some specific areas, obviously. Uh, and when we talk about uh, temporary systems, quite often, we might find temporary systems around caravan and camping parks, exhibition shows and stands, and so forth. These other things here, electrical vehicle charging, temporary electrical systems for structures and amusement devices. Okay, so there is some sort of crossover between 7671 and 7909. Okay, but again, we need to be looking at both documents. And quite honestly, the information sometimes in BS 7671 isn't always clear in regard to temporary systems. Is this covered? Isn't it covered? Does it cover this? Does it cover that? It's always down to terminology and your understanding of that. Um, the way I look at it is if it's a useful piece of information, if it helps me to install, inspect and test and keep the electrical system safe and fit for purpose, then I'll use it. Yeah. So quite often it's down to your own judgment. So for instance, 711 exhibition shows and stands uh, applies to the temporary electrical installation exhibitions, shows and stands, including mobile and portable displays. Does not apply to electrical systems as defined in 7909. That's what BS 7671 says. It says it applies to exhibition shows and stands and that 7909 does not apply. Okay. Um, so again, this is, you look at that sometimes and you think, well, surely it, 7909 would be useful for some of those things because depending on how you install, yeah, um, 7909 can actually be a more useful document. Yeah, I mean, the key question is to determine if 7909 is within scope. Yeah. And yeah. if it isn't, technically, then you've got 713. Yeah. yeah. And this, I mean, electrical exhibitions, for instance, or any sort of exhibition, it's always a uh, an interesting point of view because it is a temporary system okay um, you make something like a Lex does the wiring of the tray stands come under 7909 as entertainment or does it come under 711 as an exhibition and why would it matter hmm. and then when you consider how it's installed you know quite often and we've seen it ourselves some <laughs> of the wiring sometimes on, neither has been considered Electrical exhibitions, it, let's say sometimes it does leave a little bit to be desired. We've seen twin and earth being sort of strangled around metal framework and, mm. and old fuse boards hanging on pieces of string. Okay, sometimes it's not very good. Whereas if we'd used temporary electrical systems, a standard sort of distro and HO7 cables and stuff, it would have actually made a better job of it and would probably have been easier. And you've got a proper inspection and testing regime afterwards. If we install using old fuse boards and twin and earth and various other cables, then we have to test to BS7671. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. And obviously we'll get to a bit later on, but if you comply with 7909, it's, you know, there's a lot working for you there with things being having pre-checked, etc. Yeah. There's and this is the big, the, this is the big thing, isn't it? With temporary stuff, when we're looking at 7909, we are using, distro cables leads and stuff which have been pre-checked pre-tested and that cuts down an awful lot on the inspection and testing requirement of the finished installation if we uh put a system together using armored cable and old bits of twin and earth and old fuse boards and flex and this and the other and we actually wire it all together we've got no option but to inspect and test it to bs7671 yeah it's not very good it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare. If we well, use the temporary often, stuff, it's much easier. The other, the, I mean, the other obvious thing with this is this vent industry is such a rapid thing in that the hall is only available right at the last minute and things have to be built up so rapidly. So, you know, 
having yeah. a design or having a an approach where you wire things and you test it with the intention of testing it to seven six seven one. There's just going to be no time. Yeah, because you've got to do all the dead tests as well. Yeah. You know, you've got to do all your dead tests. You've got to do your live tests. It's it does make it top heavy with the inspection and testing requirement. So that's why quite often, if I'm doing an exhibition or a show or whatever, I will tend to install using the temporary stuff that we use for major events, and it's a much easier and actually it's a much prettier, a much better job. Again, if you've got uh, stands which are supplied from different main distribution boards, then you're going to require a separate EIC, yeah, for every stand, for elder stands from separate DBs. And this, again, is the actual time and effort you've got to put into doing a proper inspection and testing and a documentation is unmanageable. And this is why when people talk to me about exhibitions and shows and stands and stuff, I will always say to them, mm. consider doing it using temporary system stuff to yeah. be a 7909. It's a much quicker, much easier, and far more simple job. And people will argue, well, yeah, but in the regs it says, doesn't actually say you can do that. Well, sorry, my understanding and the way I look at it is if it's safe, if it's fit for purpose, if it does the job and it does the job better and safer, I'm going to use it. So if we use the temporary distro, all right, we can just use a completion certificate and schedule the testing results as per, and it's a much quicker, far more easier job. We may also need to do a confirmation of electrical completion when it's all finished, but again, that's a fairly quick process. So the actual installation, the inspection, the testing, the actual putting together of the system, okay, is far easier, far quicker, and far more manageable. So what's temporary systems all about? Well, it's all about getting electrical supply from one place to feed equipment in another place. Okay, you've got a supply, you've got a load, you've got to put a system in which will allow you to run that load from that supply in a safe and efficient manner. Unlike in our dwellings and in our offices, we can't use standard equipment, extension leads to bridge the gap. Quite often the amount of power that we're going to need is quite a lot, yeah, and the idea of doing it with 13 amp extension leads and similar is just totally unmanageable. So we have a range of different sizes and types of supply equipment, depending on how much power is required and whether we need single phase or three phase, okay, and we tend to standardize on 16 amp and 32 amp and 63 amp and 125 amp C form um, mm. for getting the power around. For larger sets of power, we use power lock, okay, at 250, 400 amp, three phase. Uh, we can use smaller extension leads if we want to drop down from a 16 amp down to a 13 amp extension lead. But there's no reason why we can't if we're using it indoors. If we're using it outdoors, then obviously everything's got to be weatherproof to IP44 as a minimum. So this is why the C form um, comes into its own because normally as a standard, if they're properly fitted and properly connected, they will be to IP44. Uh, and they're okay for being used outdoors. But that's only if they are not actually sat in a big puddle of water or underwater where we actually we have actually seen them on quite a few occasions laid in places where the water gathers and they end up submerged. Um, yeah. It's not a lot good then. They, they will tend to go bang after a while. Okay. Yeah. Now, as, as this slide says the words, depending on how much power is required, I just wanted to bring up a question that Mark said here. Yeah. But how can you limit how much demand each stand can take? Where does your design for load start and finish when you don't know what people will turn up with? And we've known that. <laughs> we've known that. Yeah. I mean, this is, this <laughs> is the problem with temporary systems. And the, 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 yeah, the, the, the swear word with temporary the systems magic. and events is, yeah. is caterers. Uh, uh, I, I, I do apologize <laughs> if anybody uh, does have a burger van or whatever, or a coffee unit. Um, yeah, they are the bane of our life because what will happen is that they will ask for a certain size of supply because they're going to bring a certain unit in. And they're thinking, well, we can sell so many units of coffee, so many burgers, so many hot dogs, whatever. And we need to run this oven and mm. that oven and so forth. And you can actually get a reasonable sort of stab, initial stab at a loading 
if you talk to the right people from the from the company. What happens then is if there's a lot of people attend the event, what will happen is the catering in fact, oh, hang on, we can sell some more coffee, we can sell some more hot dogs. We'll put another coffee machine in, we'll bring another hot dog unit in, and we'll plug it into the side of our van. And this is the issue we have. And it's always a very dynamic thing. And this is why with every, any um, temporary installation that we put in for events, uh, especially if it's going to be in there for a few days, you really need to be constantly managing and monitoring as you go around. It's not just a case of install it, test it, sign all the documentation and clear off. You need somebody on site to, to be monitored. check things. And what we tend to do with the bigger events is we tend to have a system where we will walk around and do a, at least a daily inspection of the site. Um, and it's, it's really a case of just monitoring what people are doing. And you may have to advise people sometimes, so hang on, if you want that, then you're going to need to have another supply. And, and yeah, it, it's very difficult. And there, it's, it's a moving target all the time. It, it is. And that's the point, though, is, you know, if, if you design it and you erect it and you say, right, that'll be used that way from now on, and then you turn away from it, this is all plug and play, a lot of the system, you know, just like 13 now, and you're going to have customers or clients land into a pitch or into a place mm. with their own idea of what they want. Uh, I remember when we were working... An exhibition hall, all the, all of the, um, all of the, it was like a farmer's market and all the concessions basically had just 13 amp loads for lighting and display lighting. There was a fashion show as well. Mm. Um, but the lighting would go from certain lights, lighting to full on halogen lighting, or even the heater would turn up because it was cold. Yeah. Uh, and people would just have their own idea and they plug in what they want. Yeah. Um, and you really had to patrol around. And again, if you had an event over a three day, it could be that, you know, let's say it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. It could be on the Friday that some people turn up and they go, oh, this is rubbish. I'm going to shut, I'm not going to bother with Sunday. I'm going to close down. And on the Sunday, they go maybe to another market over another county and their pitch becomes free. Now another person might go, oh, there's more footfall around that area. I'll move myself before someone else grabs it. You may have a completely different demand. And if you don't control it, that kind of behavior will happen in events. Mm. Uh, and as I also said, you'll, you know, you'll get a caterer that will come up with their own idea about how much capacity, even though they've paid for, I don't know, 32 on single phase, they'll come in with the three phase or something like that. Well, we, we had a situation, if you remember, um, this again was at Royal Ascot a number of years ago, where a baked potato unit was coming in and they said they wanted 13 amps. Um, and I actually inquired back to the company several times really? you say you say you want 13 amps yep you sure you don't want more than that no 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 13 amps are you sure you're going to run off 13 amps yeah and i put it in writing and i actually got it got them to say yeah absolutely without shadow of doubt 13 amps hmm. knowing that when they came in i knew it was going to be at least a 63 amp three phase supply and we actually stuck that round the back of the tent without them knowing, because I said to the team putting it in, I said, leave a 63 three phase. That's what they're going to need. And they came in on the day of the event or the day prior to the event um, with this big unit, which actually took um, two lots of 32 three phase. Um, and we'd left a 13 amp socket for them. But that's the and point they, though, isn't it? You go around and you can, you know, you've got, I mean, you get a plan and the plan says this is going there, that's going there. They need single yeah. phase, they need three phase. And you go, no. Or as yeah. you're putting it in, you can see the gear. Maybe the gear's arrived, waiting to be hooked up. And you go, that's too big. You do have to be very much able to reassess, redesign on the fly or have somebody oh, yeah. with you who can. Yeah. So that you can break this back, make sure protection works, make sure your selection works, make mm. sure basically selectivity works. Because yeah. um, the other, the you, other... You, 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 selectivity really becomes an issue with RCDs in this yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, the other problem you get obviously is that you know you as an electrician are thinking this is a complete pain in the backside because they only ask for this and they're wanting sort of like five six times as much. Mm -hmm. uh, and you you know you do sometimes you've got nowhere to take it from not easily anyway. And you might say to them, well, look, we can't do it. You know, you just haven't got that supply. Now what will happen is that they'll go and whinge and moan to the event organizer and say, look, we're paying all this money and we're giving you all this money for the um, a percentage of our takings, this, that, and the other. And the event organizer will then come back to you and say, can you give them a supply? You know, so it, we know it happens. We know it's going to happen. And really, all we can do is remain flexible and make sure that we've got plenty of supply, you know, 
uh, available somewhere. Uh, but it is really annoying and it is really frustrating and there's no simple answer to it. it it'll happen. It'll happen time and time again. And it'll never stop happening. Um, it's one of those. Okay, so if we don't have a suitable supply, what can we do? If, we, if the supply is too far away uh, or we need three phase and we've only got a single phase as a fixed supply, under these circumstances, we're going to need to use generators or two or 10 or 20 or 100 or so. Uh, uh, as many generators as we need. Now, generators are actually a wonderful thing because we can put generators much closer to our centers of load. Um, and that means we can cut down on length of distribution cables and so forth. And if we need a bit more load, if we need a bit more supply, then we can actually put more generators in. So I, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of generators. And I always say to people, rather than relying on whatever shoddy, uh, socket outlets you might have sitting around the place. Why not think about generators? Um, it also really helps with long lengths. We've gone to many long, yeah, long lengths. Going, hang on, yeah. there should be another Jenny over here. Yeah, and and this is it. I mean, if if, if you've got suitably and sensibly placed generators, then that can save an awful lot of hassle, mm. an awful, awful lot of hassle. And and cheaper sometimes you, with, with higher costs as well. It is because you, you're cutting down on the amount of long lengths of cable you've got to run out and distro and everything else, and it can, it can actually save you money in the long run. To get the, repi uh, the required power around the event, we need ca obviously cables and distribution boxes, and the distribution, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, they provide several functions. You've got control, you've got overcurrent uh, protection, you've got earth protection, um, you can have monitoring, uh, metering, and all sorts of stuff in there, depending on your specification for your distribution. And these should arrive on site, all inspected, all tested, all ready to go. And this is the, great, the big thing and the easy thing, the great thing about installing temporary systems to 7909. The equipment arrives on site, pre-tested, pre-inspected, all signed off we haven't got to do any dead testing it's just a case of put it together okay build it to the design and once we've got it all built then it can be switched on and we can then test it cables should be uh, hopefully um, in accordance with BS7919 and the the favorite is HO7 RNF or an equivalent um, you can use HO5 mm -hmm. indoors. You can use SY or PVC flexes um, indoors, but mm -hmm. they're not suitable for outdoor use. And so so the, question, the question really is, do you want to stop one type of cable that you never have to really think about where to use it? Yeah. Or yeah. have to yeah. make that extra decision? And this is what most companies do. They stock HO7 RNF as standard, and then that will cover all eventualities, indoor, outdoor. Okay, And it's a really good, robust, tough cable. Um, so most places will just standardize on that one type of cable. As I said, indoor cables can be SY, which is the braided flex um, and PVC flexes. But again, with the SY, remember that we should be terminated properly using the proper glands. So it actually makes it unusable. Um, so I don't like to see that. It's, it's better off for equipment, fixed equipment. Um, PVC flexes, uh, Arctic Blue was the common one that was used for years and years and years, and people had a huge stock of it. Uh, you still see people bringing it out and dragging it out. Um, it's, it's when your stock gets thin that that starts to come out as well. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's one of those where, no, we, we shouldn't be using that. It's a bit outdoors. Mm. You can use it indoors, but not outdoors. All temporary connections should be made using plugs and sockets and cable couplers, which are appropriate to the current, the voltage and the static conditions. The standard ones that we uh, tend to use are the C form, um, 32 amp, 16 amp, 63 amp, 125 amp, single amp, three phase. Okay, remember they are IP44 normally as a minimum if they are properly made off and properly connected, mated all the way. Also, Remember that the size of the cable needs to be correct so that it actually fills the gland at the back. If there's room around the cable at the back, water will encroach in from the rear of the socket and you'll get a big bang. Also remember these are uh, splash proof, IP44. They're not waterproof, so they can't be sitting in puddles or in ponds or, or whatever. 
various types of distro and we, we call them different things and quite often they might be used for the same purpose but um, mm. the ISU which is the intake switch unit is the first piece of equipment uh, like commonly a, like used a, by a generator. It's like a role isn't it? It's, it's, it's a role and its role is to be the main yeah. isolator isn't it? Yeah. yeah so we might come straight from a generator into an ISU, the ISU, the intake switch unit provides you with control and protection as required um, and what I like, I like personally, and this is me being a control freak, is I like um, ISUs with a main switch on that I can actually lock off. That makes me really popular. Yeah. Um, but also they'll have RCD protection on there, um, RCD protection for your distribution cables. Obviously the RCDs must be selectable, must be time delayed um, because you don't want to be putting 30 milliamp RCDs on distribution cables. Quite a lot of ISUs will also have 16 and 32 amp socket outlets for final circuits and they must be protected by a 30 milliamp instantaneous RCD. Uh, the RCDs themselves, um, it's actually been in BS7909 <coughs> for a number of years that we can't use type AC or we shouldn't be using type AC RCDs because of DC feedback. And this is something that's been covered by um, David and a few other members of E5 Paul have, uh, have spoken about this that different types of RCD, depending on what equipment you're plugging in, an AC type RCD, for instance, may be rendered completely useless by DC feedback from the equipment that you're actually plugging into it. So it tests out all right when you actually liven up the box because you actually haven't got any equipment connected to it. Tests out all right then, as soon as you actually plug equipment onto it and it starts drawing a load, the RCD no longer works. Now, on a lot of temporary installations, because we're using such long lengths of cable, we are totally reliant on RCD protection. So if the RCD is not working, we are in a world of pain. Uh, the central distribution unit, these are slightly smaller units, um, and commonly can be used towards the center of loads, and they can provide supplies to final distribution units, and they also can supply final circuits so they'll have a range of different types and sizes of sockets again they must have the RCD protection which is appropriate to their duty if it's a final circuit it must be 30 milliamp RCD instantaneous if it's a distribution circuit again adjustable selectable RCD with a time delay on it these all need to be set properly so we get proper discrimination or selectivity as we're now supposed to call it under 7671 Your final distribution units will be nearer to the load, right by the load, hopefully, or very close to it. Uh, and we get the supply to them, and then these will feed out to your final circuits, uh, to your pieces of equipment, your lights, your heaters, your air conditioning, all sorts of things. And these are the ones we want to be resetting during an event. Yeah, these will be the instantaneous 30 milliamp RCDs. Mm. These should be the ones that operate, should there be a piece of uh, equipment that has a fault on it or develops a fault or gets damaged during use. Uh, and it's the pieces of equipment that most of the time cause issues and get damaged and they're the ones that really will quite often go to fault. So it's the final distribution unit RCDs, hopefully, that will operate rather than taking out the whole supply. If you lose a piece of kit, if you lose a light, the power to a light, quite often people won't even notice. If you lose the whole power to the stage, they tend to notice that. And you're only as good as your last job. So if you do make a bit of a cock up of it and you lose the whole supply, um, then there's a good chance that the phone won't ring next next time round. They'll be going somewhere else. As we've mentioned, it, the pre equipment comes in the form of pre-tested, pre-inspected stock items that simply plug together. It's like a Lego kit, okay? Should all be within a valid period of testing evidenced by a suitable tested label. Quite often companies nowadays will use barcodes. And so we can, if we've got a set of barcodes, we can actually go to the company that we've hired it from and say, right, can we have all the test results for these bits of kit if necessary? Okay. Because it comes in all pre-tested, pre-inspected uh, units, simply plugged together, this saves an awful lot of time when compared to installing using lengths of cable and fuse boards and this and the other. We are simply plugging it together, 
as to the design, my design is still important. And this is one of the issues we have uh, with temporary systems is that any fool can put them together. If we put a load of temporary equipment into a schoolyard, so a load of distro, a load of leads, and loads of other bits and pieces, the kids would learn. They'd soon see what fitted where, and they'd be able to put a system together. Now, would it be safe? Probably not. Would it be usable? Probably not. Okay. So it needs, obviously, to be installed as per design. But the e ease of use and the ease of installation and, and putting it together must not okay, be overshadowed by safety and so forth. We need to follow design. We need to make sure we get protection right. We need to get the RCD discrimination selectivity correct and so forth. Not overloading cables. We don't want to see cables going from a 63 amp to 232 amp spitter without any few, uh, MCBs in, in line. Uh, we see that quite often. Um, so you end up with cables that are not properly protected. Okay, so proper uh, design and proper installation. It needs to be done with a modicum of uh, common sense and knowledge. So we end up with a system which is possibly similar to this. Uh, you'll have a generator feeding an ISU. Your ISU may feed a number of CDUs and the CDUs may feed a number of FDUs. Um, you might just come off the generator straight to a CDU and that might be all you need. So there's no sort of strict uh, design to this. There's no strict sort of, oh, you must use this, you must use that. You use what you need to use and you remain flexible, you remain dynamic. This is the thing about temporary installations and this is why, you know, contrary to popular belief, all right, the fact that any fool can put them together, yeah, we shouldn't have a fool doing it. And it, uh, because it is so simple and because it is so easy to get a system connected together, it needs to be done by people that know what they're doing. That's like so Lego, you need isn't it? That yeah, you need that electrical knowledge. Uh, it's like building a, br a bridge out of Lego. Anybody can build a bridge, but an engineer would actually have a safer bridge and a stronger bridge than I would. Um, so, yeah, it needs to be somebody that knows what they're doing. So we need to have control over who's actually in charge of the job and who's putting the design together and who's making sure that design is followed. As we said, it's, it's, it's very careful of its choice of language. It talks about systems rather than installations. Okay. Um, from BS 7909, an installation is items which are not part of the temporary system. Okay, and they're permanently fixed in position and they're not intended to be removed. So that's why we use the terminology of system. Generally, it doesn't require any tools. Most of the time, there's no requirement for any live work. Uh, we do occasionally find systems that are connected onto buzz bars. Obviously, if we are connecting onto a buzz bar, directly onto a buzz bar, then we will need to arrange for shutting down, isolation and all the rest of it, permit to work systems and whatever. Um, so that's a fairly lengthy, fairly drawn out process. It's not the summit you can just, oh, we'll just mm. get on there and wear some rubber gloves really, and hope for the best. It's not very popular in my opinion, because when you have that method, when a companies, when an event has been run five or six times, the buzz bars just look knackered. You know? Remember, so those, buzz, not... remember those buzz bars in Dubai? Yes. Oh, Ooh, that was nasty. That was yeah, nasty. yeah, it was, yeah, not, not good. Um, so yes, generally we don't need any tools, although not always. Sometimes there may be a requirement to connect something permanently onto a system just to get some supply off of it. It's normally, we say mainly brawn rather than brain. Um, yeah, the leads and the distro is quite heavy. So it's a case of, you know, we need a good amount of uh, labor to get the system out and get it in place. It's got to be done quick as well. It's got to be done because these things are dynamic and mm. quite often it's the nature of the beast. People don't want systems in for weeks prior to an installation. They won't give you loads of time so you can just saunter along and put these things in at your own mm. leisurely pace because obviously it will cost money. So if most things are brought in at last minute. Okay. And it's a case of trying to squeeze that down the higher period and everything else to a minimum. So you end up working long hours you know, um, without breaks. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. However, it can be enjoyable. It can be good fun. And, uh, there's a sense of achievement when you get it all installed in time. Uh, so yes, a lot of, lot of brawn need, needed, 
but also we do need brain because we need to make sure we are installing to design and doing it properly. We're normally relying on a person yeah, to be in charge of a team. That, that person will take responsibility for the electrical system and then they're referred to as the person responsible. They take responsibility for the electrical system, the temporary electrical system, uh, used for an event or activity. Their competence, they need to be competent, suitably competent for the system involved. And this is where BS7909 breaks down temporary systems into certain sizes. It talks about small systems, it talks about large systems. Small systems is anything up to 6 kVA, so we're looking at about 26 amps, a couple of 13 amp extension leads. Up until that point, they talk about it being a small electrical system, temporary system. Of a small system, then the person responsible for that doesn't need to be a fully qualified electrician. It can be somebody who's just got a bit of common sense. How much electrical knowledge do you need to look after two 13 amp extension leads after all? So anybody with a common sense, what that means is that you can go along and put in a couple of extension leads for a school fate, for instance, um, for a PA system in an ice cream van. And it means you don't have to stand there all day looking like a Wally standing next to it. Um, to manage and control the system because you can hand it over to one of the teachers and say, look, you can take control of this. You look like a sensible person. You know, don't let the kids chew on the cables. Don't let anybody put the end in a bucket of water and so forth or set fire to the cables. It's common sense. Okay. So a small system, the person responsible only needs to be competent to look after that very small system. So then it means that they don't have to be a qualified electrician. When we come to a larger system, say something like Glastonbury or Royal Ascot, then yes, we may have a qualified electrician or should have a qualified electrician as the person responsible for that, because there's an awful lot of other factors that need to be included within the design and within the management and supervision of the system. So the size and the complexity of the system will dictate who can be the person responsible. And the thing is, is that if you are deemed to be or nominated to be the person responsible, look around the system, look around the equipment that's involved and just consider, do I know enough about this? Am I suitably competent in this? And if you think, yeah, I can manage this, then that's fine. But if you look at it and think, mm, not sure, then you need to say, well, perhaps we need to get somebody else in on this or perhaps I need some sort of supervision or maybe a bit of um, education. Yeah. So temporary system often installed by a team made up of labor, which are the people that are instructed. This is a general muscle for putting the system in. Okay, and they will be supported by semi-skilled persons who may have some basic electrical knowledge and they may have done, for instance, a 7909B course, okay, which goes through the requirements of 7909. So they know what is required and what is expected. They've got that little bit of knowledge. And then there will be a responsible person or maybe a number of responsible persons if it's a really large system and they will have the suitable electrical skills and knowledge for the system involved. For that, they may have completed the 7909C course, okay, which goes into a bit of design and inspection and testing. So there's a range of different uh, skills and levels of knowledge involved with temporary systems. A quick question here from Sean on that then. So Sean. is the person responsible, responsible for the instructed person? The person responsible will be responsible for the electrical system and for the team that will be working, actually installing it and putting it together. Are they likely to then be a skilled person? Or is the person responsible for an instructed person a skilled person who may also be a responsible person? Oh, my head. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Um, yeah. Right. They need to be suitably competent. Okay, for the system that is being put in, Suitably and they, will, they, be they will be responsible for the system and the people working on it. Suitably it competent. Would we just take that straight from electricity work regulations? Here we go. Yeah, suitably competent. Yeah. Uh, do you know enough? And this is this is the thing about the word competence, isn't it? Okay. Um, the only person that knows how competent you are is yourself. Uh, and so you may be asked to do something, and when you look around the system, do you know enough about temporary systems? Do you know enough about the inspection and testing of the temporary system? Do you know enough about 
um, fault current, short circuit protection, RCD, selectivity, and all the rest of it. Do you know enough about the equipment that's going to be used and how it's going to affect the system? Do you know enough about generators, loading? If you know all that and you've got that suitable competence, then fine. Hmm. Relative to the nature depends, of the work, isn't it? It all depends on the complexity of the system. And this is one of these things where, okay, you might have somebody who is okay to be the person responsible on a fairly small event, yeah. not Sean, very complex. Sean has apologized for his question. No, no, no. I'll keep he's, throwing them in. He's yeah. looking for the liability angle here. But yeah. no, yeah, it's, it's valid. Um, responsible person, to me, responsible person is a, is a ter, you know, it's a generic term that the law yeah. will identify. With. That's where the buck stops. The, the buck law stops won't look at skilled or instructed. The law doesn't look at skilled or instructed. It looks at things like duty holder, responsible persons, yeah. persons responsible, because those are authorized roles. Yeah. Those do not define skills. Yeah. For for any temporary electrical system used for an event, the person responsible is ultimately responsible for the safety and the correct running and the uh, you know the maintenance and whatever yeah. of that electrical system. Again, fundamentally, you could work uh, you could work in a hotel, and they could want an extension lead to go from the lobby to the Christmas tree in the entrance lobby. Now you might be a member of maintenance staff and it might be that you are reasonably competent to prevent danger for that small scale system. Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't you're not technically skilled from the perspective of designing, commissioning, installing, and fabricating an installation. No. But you are, according to the law, suitable to determine compliance with the requirements of competence. Yeah. Under for PUA, small scale systems. Under PUA regulation six. Yeah. Any temporary electrical installation, which could be an extension lead, yeah, must be inspected before use. As it's being inspected, mm -hmm. okay, that then brings into mind, well, if you're going to inspect it, how are you going to prove that you inspected it to comply with this legislation? The only way of proving you've inspected it is to produce documentation. Well, that's just the way employers do or issuing of appliances to people that work with pat testing anyway. So as long as there's a strategy where there's pat testing involved and there's user checking, the person can pick up an extension lead, carry out formal visual inspection, and then... Yeah. I'm not saying they're testing it, though. Well, no, but there's, there's, it's, it's, yeah. When we're looking at temporary systems, there should be mm. documentation. And this is what we're trying to push more and more and more because there's so many. You've seen it yourself when you've taken the kids out at Christmas to the shops and you see extension leads going to Christmas trees uh, and how they're still, work, how they're still working. We don't, you know, we haven't got a clue. It's just um, their luck. It's the luck of load. Yeah. Or lack of load. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it is, it is an issue. Um, it's like with any electrical system. Uh, even with a fixed installation, you might be part of a team putting a fixed installation into a, a, a building. Okay, you'll have a spark who is in charge of the team, and they may be people with different levels of skill throughout that team doing different activities. But the senior electrician there will be the person that signs it all off and mm -hmm. says it's all done. So it's a similar type of thing. Yeah, the person responsible and has the ultimate responsibility. And in the case of a place like a hotel or anything like that, you know, there is someone who is responsible as a duty holder for the system. And you know the law would just look at them directly for taking the right action, hmm. and that would be by default suiting you know suitable responsible persons to do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's other questions coming in about earthing, so should I wait until you've done <laughs> earthing for a little bit? <laughs> Don't we love earthing? Yeah. Earthing, earthing and temporary systems. Good grief, we could spend a couple of weeks on that. Um, okay. So the supply sources. If you're going to plug into a source a fixed installation source if you're going to plug into anybody's socket outlet you need to make sure it's safe before you plug into it um so generally we carry out an inspection along with looking at polarity earth fault loop impedance and checking the perspective fault current um before we use it also mm -hmm. check what the protective devices are behind it okay if there's an rcd or an rcbo that needs to be tested as well don't just go willy-nilly plugging into sockets um, as we said, because all this stuff is pre-tested, pre-inspected before it arrives on site, there is no requirement for a continuity test or insulation resistance test. That's all done prior to its arriving. When we lay out the equipment, I get guys to, it's what I call a shake and sniff. Yeah. So as you're keep, laying I out keep, extension leads. I keep leads, shaking my head at this picture. Yeah, I know. Every I know. time I see it. 
You, yeah. Is this what come up when you Googled or something? <laughs> what is so, shake and sniff? So shake and sniff. So you've got the coupler. Yeah. Yeah. Give it a shake. If you hear it rattle, there's a screw loose. Yeah. Give it a sniff. If it smells funny, okay, you know that there's a bit of arcing or loose connection inside. Yeah. You'll smell it way before you see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And way before it sort of starts to catch fire. So that simple action as you're laying out the lead, shake it, sniff it. it takes a couple of seconds. Okay. It's so important and it's, it can prove, it can sort of uh, detect issues that may have been missed. Yeah. Um, because with the best will in the world, people doing the inspection and testing of these leads in a warehouse where they're going through mountains of these things, yeah, things get occasionally through. things get missed. Well, we've okay. had a, we had a food van get through, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So shake and sniff. Mm -hmm. People, people think a bit weird when they see me sniffing uh, ex uh, extension leads and couplers, but there you go. I don't care. Uh, in practice, um, we tend to energize the system as we lay it out. And one of the reasons behind that is I always say to the guys when they're putting the distro out, always test your RCDs. As soon as you've laid that distro out and powered it up, do a physical functional test a on functional the RCDs. The device, yeah. Just check them. All right. And again, it's, it is quite often we get the, the, the occasional RCD that is no longer working. Mm. What do we do with that? Well, preferably we take the piece of distro out of use label it sign it up and put it mm. to one side and that goes if you haven't away. got that option now you're going to have to label that circuit not to use don't you this is the other option Lock if you are if you are desperate for equipment and you need to use that um piece of equipment that piece of distro okay as long as you don't need all the circuits you can label up that one circuit mark it off make sure everybody knows make sure nobody uses it okay and then make sure obviously once uh, it's removed afterwards it goes off to be changed and altered um, so yeah, we can check the RCDs. Also, we need to set the RCDs up for selectivity and discrimination. Mm -hmm. All right, we need to be doing that as we go around. That will all be done. It seems to be. It seems to be this natural need for us to try and get our RCDs, especially through ISUs down to maybe CDUs, as close to thirty milliamp for some reason, when we could have them an amp yeah. or so. Uh, yeah, I mean, people look at me a bit strange when I talk about a one amp RCD with a yeah. with a one second delay on it. Yeah, that's why not. It's, it's a fairly common yeah. situation. When I'm doing is, major major events, that's, the, that's mm. the sort of levels we're using. If you've got a large scale system, if you try and go, well, I'll have time delay on the 30 milliamp, you'll have protective conductor current buildup, which will take that out straight away. No. You know. 30, mil 30 milliamps must be instantaneous, no time delay on all final circuits. Okay. Yeah, uh, but if you had a 30 milliamp time delay on a ISU supplying an ICU supplying an FDU. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But again, this is one of those things where you think, hang on. Let's. Let, and what I say to guys is, is keep the 30 milliamp for your final circuits instantaneous. Yeah, no mm -hmm. delay. Then you want to go back up. And what I tend to do is go from 30, I go to 300. Mm. And that's just a personal thing. Okay. I, I tend to go to 300. Because instantaneous shouldn't trip that, should it? Yeah, this is it. My so favorite. I tend to go to 300 with maybe a half second delay. Then I'll go mm -hmm. to 500 with a three quarter of a second delay. Then I'll go to one amp with a one second delay. And if necessary, three amp RCD. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you check out BS7909, they say three amp RCD for a 400 amp supply, you know, with, with a couple of second delay or, or maybe a two second delay. There's no, there's nothing wrong with having an RCD. And I, I think this is one of the things that installation electricians, especially, yeah, get a little bit. Oh, you know, uh, the idea of having a one amp RCD with a, a one second delay on it. They think, oh God, you know, is that going to do anything? Yes, well, it's it because will. it's because obviously we assume the RCD is there to protect against life or the purpose of you know additional protection. Yeah, when it's not there for that purpose in here. No, we're looking at protecting distribution equipment and stuff like that yeah. with the, with these larger sizes of RCD. So, yeah, it's it's something we've got to get used to when we're dealing with uh, temporary systems. We've got to mm. get used to having that selectivity all the way through. Um, um, and using those larger levels of RCD protection. There's nothing wrong with it as long as we conform with the uh, requirements of 7909. Mm -hmm. It does take a bit of testing, though, to get it balanced right. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And the thing is also is that if you've got one of these new, newer type digital RCDs where you have to push buttons in certain order oh, to actually yeah. get them, uh, different makes and different models you have mm -hmm. to test, you have to set up in different ways. If you haven't got the instructions, it's a blooming nightmare. 
the older type ones where you had the screw terminals on fantastic you know mm. great you can see what you're doing but having set them up i would always test them because it may you may be looking at it thinking well, that's on 300 milliamp when you actually test it it might actually be 350 milliamp mm. or 360 that's what we're going to the ramp test now as well yeah ramp testing is ideal yeah mm. so um so once we're complete we always test the system we're looking at doing earth loop at the distros and at the end of circuits we're looking at doing fault current at the distros and at the end of circuits. Most important that we do fault current at the end of circuits. And that, if you think about it, guys, is RCDs will provide with us, provide us with earth fault protection, even if we've got a fairly long circuit. You know, a 30 milliamp RCD, we're looking at 1,667 ohms, yeah, and it will still trip uh, before it goes over a 50 volt sort of touch voltage. Mm. Short circuit, RCDs don't work on short circuit. You may as well use a chocolate teapot. The RCDs don't work on short circuit. So if we've got a very long circuit, we may have a high impedance, which gives us a lower fault current, but the fault current might be high enough to set fire to the cable, but not high enough to take out the type C breaker. Remember that most distro, tempi distros come with type C breakers. Some even come with a type D breaker. And you experienced so, this a couple of years ago, didn't you? Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, not half, yeah. Mm. So this is a very important test that we have to do on temporary. We look at doing fault current tests, short circuit, at the end of the circuits. And this was new to me when I first got into doing temporary. You mm. know, being an installation electrician, I'm used to doing fault current at the intake and at the main distro. And once you get to a and, certain level, you don't bother anymore. And I said at the beginning of this webinar that we've actually adapted our seven six seven one testing strategy with yeah. what we've discovered from seven nine oh nine. And what the webinar we've got coming up this Thursday, which is the hidden tests, I believe. Yeah. This is one of them that we will discuss and we'll discuss why we've you know, why we've done this. Yeah. I did an EICR before Christmas, I think it was. And we had a circuit, radial circuit, four mil and a C thirty two. I think, which mm. requires 320. Uh, and we had an amp measurement between line and neutral, something like 198, wasn't it? All right. 198 amps, mm. uh, which when we calculated the withstand formula to determine the length of time, it was too long. So the disconnection of the circuit would have been way too long considering the, you know, the, the temperature of the cable. Yeah. Um, we don't but, do that yeah. right now in 7671. So. No, but how many circuits have we come across when we've been doing fixed installation testing since we've been doing this, how many circuits have we come across where lots. we've actually found this issue? Lots yeah. and lots. And it's, a, it's amazing. And this is one of the issues. Remember that when we're looking at protection of electrical systems, you know, with so much emphasis on fault protection against electric shock, what we've got to really consider is the other big issue, which is fire protection. Yeah, and if we don't get proper disconnection of the circuit under short circuit conditions, then the next thing that will happen is the cables are going to overheat and we could possibly have a fire. And there's far more people die from fires than there is that die from electric shock. Mm. So it is an issue. And this is, as I said, as you said earlier, this is something that we've picked up from doing temporary systems. Okay. The other test we will do um, on our temporary system is we'll do some random RCD tests. And um, we don't, we do a few of those. It's just, I'll just sort of pick things at, um, at random. And I will actually do a proper RCD test going through the... Well, I'm going to pick up a question from Andy just come in here. Are there additional tests for distros with RCBOs? Uh, again, it's one of these things that you, we will, once we've set the RCBOs up, if they are adjustable or selectable, we will, you should really test them to make sure they are operating at the right level. Um, so yes, we will test the distros. I tend to test the distros for selectable RCDs. And that's mainly because I'm always uh, mindful of the fact that I might not have got the selection right. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes, especially with the analog ones, uh, sorry, digital ones where you use the press buttons, you see the number 30 come up. You think, oh, I've set that at 30 milliamps. What you've actually done is you put a 30 second delay in. <laughs> and this is one of the issues. So I tend to, with the larger size RCDs and RCBOs in, in the distro, I will tend to test those. Okay, because I want to check that I've done selectivity and I've got the actual rating correct mm. on my adjustment. Mm -hmm. With instantaneous RCDs, now these should have all been tested back at base. Uh, 
yeah. with the instantaneous RCDs on your final distribution circuits and stuff like that, this is just a, a few random checks we will yeah, do with an RCD test. It's important to note that you said should. We have in our experience seen some companies testing like PATS testing distros and not really having the right instrument to properly test RCD effectiveness. No. More just no. continuity insulation testing. Uh, so it's well, <laughs> very important that you verify RCD yourself. I've seen a company testing distro, didn't know what an RCD test was. Yeah, exactly. So. They were a PAT testing firm and didn't know what an RCD test was. Mm. Okay, I don't think you should be doing that, guys. Right. Um, certification. This is this is the oh hello, just jump one. This is the scheduler test results that we use for temporary. So you can see it's totally different to the scheduler test results for a fixed installation. This is taken directly from seven nine oh nine, and you can you can adapt these and you can make your own up. Okay, but you can see that the actual tests that are done there are fault current, and they're done at the end of the circuits. The earth loop at the end, phase rotation. Uh, polarity, and then the rest of it is all to do with RCDs. The RCD test itself, is it done by using a touch the test button, or is it done by measurement using a test meter, the rating of the RCD, the delay of the RCD. So very, very minimal amount of testing. An RCD test is normally using the push button. Yeah. If you've got a selectable RCD, then I will test it using an RCD tester to make sure Again. I've done the setting right. So again, continuity insulation has all been carried out at the yeah. pre-check of selection of all of the all carried out equipment. back at base. Yeah, so, so we don't have to do that on site. What we yeah. need to do is connect it together, then wrap up what the value will be when we add the source of you know the yeah. the, uh, yeah. the source of energy, yeah. which the impedances and the PSCC there, which is truly unique yeah. to seven nine nine. Yeah. And the thing is, because quite often, most of the time, the leads will come in standard sizes, standard lengths, mm. we, sh we should have a good idea of what the resistance should be. Yeah. So if we've got a 20 meter lead, which is a 32 amp using a 6 mil cable, and it's 20 meters long, we should know roughly what the resistance that should be. So if we've got three of those plugged into a piece of distro, and we've got an earth loop of X amount at the distro, and we've got an earth loop of X amount, uh, Y amount at the end of the circuit, we should, hopefully, if once we know those lengths, we mm. should be able to, oh yeah, that should be about that much. And when we do a test, we're verifying, also, you know, we get an earth loop impedance reading, but we're also verifying the continuity and the connections all the way through. If we get a high reading, we know there's an issue. And this again comes with experience. But what mm. I mean, what I tended to do with, when we were putting systems together, if the guys are not aware of it or if they're not experienced, is I'll give them a, a table and say, right, okay, a six mil lead. If it's twenty meters long, we should have a resistance of that. You know, so if you have that onto a distro when we do a test result, we should get that. It's like so, if we had a three phase lead or a three phase distro, we'd always measure the loop impedance to each phase. Yes, because yeah. you know if we have a higher L three. We then it's, know well. It's B2, a loose connection. L1 to L1 and L2 to Earth are the same. Then L3 is higher, so we have an issue with the phase of L3. Yeah. But yeah. if we have, for example, the same size cable, we have a line to neutral circuit impedance that is lower than the life to Earth. It could be an Earth problem. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's you know with reg regular testing you learn the patterns. Yeah. So it's, it's a case of when we're doing the testing, it's not just a case of pressing a button, taking a number and writing it down. We're analyzing the results all the time. Mm. And that's, that's what makes the difference between people that know what they're doing and people that are just playing at it. Yeah. Um, we produce a completion certificate at the end. Yeah. 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 We produce a completion certificate at the end and the completion certificate uh, is handed to the event manager. So the event manager is the person who's actually in charge of the event. They're looking at all, all the aspects of the event, security, uh, collecting litter, arranging for beer and food and everything yeah, else. All of it. They, they won't have any electrical, probably won't have any electrical knowledge at all. So all they need is a piece of paper to say, yeah, the electrical system is ready to go. All the inspection and testing documentation, the person responsible will hang on to because it only means really anything to them. If anything goes wrong, they're the ones who's going to be referring to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if we have a number of completion certificates, because we've got a large number of different systems and large number of zones, maybe like Glastonbury, we've got all these different uh, fields and this that, and the other. 
then we might have a confirmation of electrical completion and that's the document that will go to the event manager. So just to summarise in, um, 7909 covers temporary systems for entertainment, etc. It allows systems to be assembled by operatives who don't need to be qualified electricians, but there should be a person with suitable competence okay, for the system that is involved. If it's a larger, more complex system, then hopefully that will be a qualified electrician. Okay, so they can inspect, test, analyze results, and make sure that it's all installed to design. It's important to understand that this kit, you plug it in, the lights go on, stuff arrives, they plug back in, it works. Yeah. Doesn't mean you've Just done your safe. job. Doesn't mean it works under our thought, doesn't mean it works under short circuit currents. And that's yeah. why that extra level of knowledge, electricians, yeah. is very key. Yeah. Um, but, it's, but it's like with fixed installations, any fool can get it to work. Hmm. You know, we, we see enough bad installations to see that. It's still working, but my goodness me, you know, no, nobody in their right mind would put their name to it. Um, and it's the same with temporary systems. We, we, we do have a number of, you know, there's some good operators within the temporary system uh, field, and there's the, uh, the occasional sort of fly by night who I think, my goodness me, they'll be better off doing something completely different. Uh, and it's just the nature of the game. It's the nature of the electrical industry as a whole, really, is that we've got some really good people, and we've got a few shoddy ones, and you think, mm, yeah. Any fool can make it work, but it takes somebody who knows what they're doing to make it work properly and makes it make it safe. Again, the thing with events is, you know, with events like you've got marquees going up, you've got caterers coming in, and the caterers <laughs> to the caterers, mm -hmm. the biggest, most important thing for the whole event is that their power is ready because their ice cream is going to melt or their booze is going to go warm. Yep. And you can get those pressures from other people when you're just trying to maintain your work. You might end up going off of script of your normal install to try and rush other areas or other people so you've got to have the ability to be dynamic to adjust things but on the spot and that does require that extra level of competence really yeah. to make sure you don't yeah. go unsafe indeed <clears throat> right okay so that um gets us to the end right uh, but then there was here, there were some questions I, I just want to throw i've actually added some bits to this okay all right, so before we go to the questions that the guys are thrown in, this might actually answer some of the questions that the guys are throwing forward. This is a question off your Sparky Ninja forum. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's your fault. Um, is this from Discord? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're the worst ones. It's just, yeah. I, 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 I feel dumb in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. An, inno an innocent question that an innocent thing question. Cause, causes me hours of, of work and research. Um, uh, a question referring to bonding a generator to a main supply when they share an electrical environment. Easiest way this is achieved. Uh, the guy works on the film industry, always using generators, multiple con conversations with numerous gaffers. The gaffer is normally the, uh, the sort of chief electrical guy around film um, with no definitive answer. Um, yeah, I've, I've worked with a few gaffers. Of, it's sort of like, um, yeah grandfather writes some of them they, they've yeah. been doing the job for donkey's years but they didn't actually ever do any electrical qualifications some of them there's some really good knowledgeable gaffers I, i'm not saying they're all like that what yeah. i'm saying is that there are the occasional ones that have got grandfather rights so well, i mean to be perfectly industry. honest i mean yeah. when we started delivering this subject we ended up having to go into that area because our our background was sports yeah but we you know i worked with uh panel panavision or another company uh, you've done some work with a couple of uh, studios and we learn a lot yeah. as we go in we find out what they're like there is it is its own little institution yeah it's quite fun. And, and there's still a lot more for me to learn as well you know yeah. this is the thing it's a never-ending cycle of learning and mm. oh reacting and oh my gosh i don't know enough about that i need to learn some more all right we'll go through this of, question and i can every day's a school others. day so anyway so i put a response to this on your forum when we're what we're looking at is the fact that we've got a generator going into a building the building's already got a fixed supply. The generator's uh, supply is going into the building to provide additional loading there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and what 7909 says is that we should link the earth systems together so that we don't get any differential between the earthing systems. Okay, the generator obviously is providing a supply. The generator uh, has its own earth, right? Uh, a lot of the time this nowadays we put the... I put yeah. an earth rod in for a reference. But is this only a problem? The ground. 
is this only actually a problem if users or maybe livestock could come into contact with the two environments? Well, if you're going into a building, remember that you're going to have electrical equipment coming off the generator supply. And within the building, you're going to have electrical Strange equipment and the bonding and various other bits and pieces, which are connected difference. to the fixed installation. Gotcha. Now, the fixed installation, it's going to have its own earthing system, which is going to be connected to, obviously, from the transformer earth electrode, whether it's a TNS or a TNCS. Um, or if it's a TT, it's going to have its own external electrode in, in the building. Now, the generator earth electrode, um, obviously, as we said before, the generator has its own earth anyway. And even if it was floating in midair, uh, it would still have uh, effectively an earth. Mm -hmm. um, but we tend to put an earth electrode in for a reference. In other words, referencing the generator to true earth. But that may be quite a distance away from the building. So you may get a difference in voltage between the two earthing systems. Okay, and to overcome that, 7909 um, recommends the connection of the two earthing systems within the building. Now, what it actually says, or did state, was the fact that you should take an earth conductor from the generator and connect it to the main earth terminal of the building. Now, that earth conductor needs to be sized to chapter 54.7, yeah? Um, so you can imagine it's going to be quite a chunky bit of cable. A 7671. Yeah, quite a chunky bit of cable, and that's going to be running for, could be 100 metres or more, or a couple of hundred metres across the floor, and then you're connecting onto the MET of the building. Well, the, the physical yeah. and, and practicalities of that is quite difficult, and obviously considering that, you know, going into a disc board or going into an earth system or disconnecting thing, it, it, it's fraught with all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so an easier way of overcoming this and something that I've used myself is if you've got distro coming off of your generator, mm -hmm. uh, so you've got a large cable feeding your distro, your distro might be inside the building. Your distro is much closer to your fixed installation. If you've got distro off your fixed installation and distro off your generator, you could just put an earth conductor between those two. They're much closer together, yeah? Yep. And you are effectively linking them together, all right, achieving the same thing, but in a much easier, much more practical sense. Um, so that was my answer, and I said about... Um, there was, um, that makes sense. There was somebody mentioned on Discord, though, that... Sometimes the MET is not accessible. Yeah. And there is recommendation that you could go to an extraneous conductive part that's connected to the MET. Yeah, like a radiator? <laughs> like, well... Or water pipe? The, the suggestion was lightning protection system, but not lightning protection itself. And there was something else mentioned. I haven't looked into this. I just read the Discord. Yeah. But right. then when you talk about radiators and things, that's just bizarre to me. Yeah, it is. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I've, what I've used before. Okay. And that is, um, uh, obviously, yeah, connecting onto an MET. If the MET is external to the fuse board, it's not so bad. If it's internal, then obviously you've got to open fuse board up and obviously you've got to look at the business of safety and everything else. So what we've had before is, and I've actually got them here, all right, got these. So that goes onto the MET. Okay. It's just, it's just a lead. All okay. right. Okay. That goes on to the MET, and that dangles. It dangles, does it? Does it dangle? Yep. All right. Dangles off, your, dangles off the DB. Okay. okay. Then we have another lead. Right. Not a socket to... That plugs into your DB off your generator. Gotcha. And that is on the other end so it's like of, this, little... of this lead. Yeah. Nice. So that is basically just an earth lead. Right. So we've got the lead coming out of the board yeah. with that on it. Yeah. yeah. And then we've got a lead coming from your generator. That's your generator. That's the other end of your generator lead. Mm. Then you've got your lead that goes from the end of that into your fuse board, linking the two together. Okay. So that is one way of achieving that. And I've used that on a couple of, couple of jobs. Now, that is... That is using a, th I've got a th those are a 32 amp single phase plugs. Mm. Um, so the maximum you can get into them is a 10 mil earth. If you have uh, a bigger 
socket locally off your distro, you could use a 63 amp or even 125 amp if you wanted to. And we do have larger sizes of those arranged. So that is one way that we've achieved this. We've actually gone into a fuse board or gone into an MET and installed that lead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we've gone from a local distro off of the generator and we've linked the two together using that. Now, I was just thinking about, and um, Paul's mentioned this in chat actually, because I'll read Paul's response actually. He says, I get this answer. My concern would be if the building supply failed and earth fault on the temporary system, could it potentially backfeed into the public supply if the fault part has a lower impedance and could possibly cause a hazard for the short period of the fault? If the impedance part is of lower impedance for the fault part back. <sighs> Structural steel work or similar, could that be considered as an acceptable con um, option because that's conductors under 7671? If it's, all been, if it's all bonded and connected, yeah. Mm. But the... Th the the issues we've got here is that if you've got a fault, and I've got a, I think I've got a slide here. This is, as I say, this is re really difficult to answer in a very short period of time. Um, we could spend a day looking at this. Um, well, do you know, it's, I'm, here's, I'm here going to go to the origin of this question, actually, look at a couple of options for this. Here was a response that came up on your Discord. The guy wasn't, um, wasn't totally convinced with my answer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm totally okay with that, and I totally understand. Um, okay. You know, and, and as I say, the, the great thing about Discord and your forums is it gets us all talking and chatting. Um, me, as a, as a person that's installing these things and testing them, I have to think about the practicalities of getting these systems in and up and working yeah. and safe. Yeah. This goes back to 7909. So is your option 27909 or is 7909 have your option? Well, my option com complies with 7909. Okay, it, but it does it in a different way. And what we've got to consider, um, and this is, this is a further <laughs> response, yeah? And the guy asked a, a specific question about a 200 kVA twin Jenny set feeding lighting for a concert, right? which is actually inside a church, which has yes. got a fixed installation fed by a PME system. Yes. Okay? Um, and you've actually mentioned a, a book that we, was written by a guy that we both know, Yes, some of them, uh, where he suggested sort of using connecting other things, uh, other conductive parts. Uh, okay, so and, and the chap he was mentioned what to connect onto a radiator. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with his um, sarcasm there. Um, so yeah, again, it sort of brings all sorts of things to light. Mm. So I've actually done this little slide. I was about to say, have yeah. you actually left my Discord? Is that what? You're <laughs> so. I've actually done this slide and looking at the layout that he's actually mentioning and we, here we got the two jennies, the twin set jennies, which are obviously synchronized feeding mm -hmm. a distro. And then from that distro, we're feeding into a distro inside the church, which is feeding the supplies for the concert, the lighting and everything else. Right. Inside the church, there is a TNCS system with its own distribution board feeding the equipment and, and mm -hmm. stuff that is normally inside the church. Now, the issue being is that obviously some of the equipment fed off of the temporary distro could be very close to some of the equipment fed off the fixed installation. Mm -hmm. So there could be simultaneous contact. You've got a different earthing system. You've got an earthing system from the generator. You've got an earthing system from the TNCS from the transformer earth electrode. Um, and it does say, if you read 7430, it, it does say that main earth terminals are very rarely at zero, yeah, yeah. Uh, because of all sorts of things, fault currents and leakage and this, that and the other. They're very rarely at zero, which is why we could get a difference in potential between the two earth systems. Mm -hmm. If your fixed installation in your uh, church, if the MET there is not at zero, maybe at several volts, and your generator system is at several volts it might be in the other direction so you could get a potential difference between the two which is actually detectable and may involve you getting a, a bit of a, t a tickle off it okay and this is one of the reasons why 7909 says okay if you've got this situation link the two earth systems together mm. effectively what you're doing is bonding two earth systems that's what you're doing so you're you're yeah? so you're gonna put your little lead into yeah. the met of this tncs system connect that onto the earth bar, you're then going to take a lead from that distro and plug it in. Yeah, effectively bonding, the, effectively bonding the two earth systems together. So you're eliminating the potential difference between the two earth systems. Remember that 
the equipment normally in use, if it's got metal casing like light fittings and stuff like that, if it's connected to the generator system, the light fittings, the metal casing, though, may be several volts removed from metal work of the fixed installation equipment. So anybody in simultaneous contact with the two, ooh, get a little ticket. This is the it. problem. This is the problem with that thing, though, is because we can then just open up more cans of worms. I mean, yeah. I mean, dare I bring in the question of PME, which, which you know, well, yeah, which Sean PME, has dared to mention here. Yeah, he would you do, know. wouldn't he? He would do. <laughs> Obviously, with PME, you've got multiple yeah. electrodes, which are very close to the actual building itself. So if you had a lot of other extremely conductive parts, that would be a cause for it. Uh, you'd have to start yeah. bringing that into consideration. What? And again, this is one of these things where I always try and go back to basics. Okay, we've got an uh, electrical system here off the generator. If there is a fault on a piece of electrical equipment, which is connected to that system, okay, the fault path will be back through the electrical system coming from the generator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fault the fault will always try to return to its origin. The fault current will, because that's the natural way for it to go. Yeah, same with the fixed installation. Any fault on there, the fault path should be back through the fixed installation. That's the natural direction for it to go. Now, I totally understand. I think somebody's mentioned it. That if you had a fault on the system and there was an issue with the other system, yeah, would the fault current then tend to try and want go back down the other system? So you end up with a, a fault actually going from, for, for instance, from the equipment provided by the generator, you have an earth fault on a piece of equipment, and then there's a break in the earth to the generator. So instead of going that way, it goes back through the fixed installation earth, back into the ground, and then through the ground, back to the earth electrode of the generator, and then back up that way. Now, yeah. yes, yes, it could happen. But remember... Again, we're looking at scenarios where we're looking at multiple faults. And mm. time and time again, we're told in BS 7671, we can only legislate for single fault conditions. Mm. You know? So, yes, I understand people's thoughts and, and worries about these things, but we've got to try and think, well, hang on. Yeah, we can legislate for single fault conditions. If we've got multiple faults or multiple systems, yeah, then, yeah, there's very little we can do about those. Because otherwise, we'll, we'll end up with basically running everything off an isolating transformer, mm. yeah, Ind individually. Because that's the only way of keeping it safe. Well, if Paul Skirm keeps hypothesising, that's what we're going to have to do. Oh, well, there you go. See, so I'll blame him for everything. He's, um, uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's actually saying, you know, this goes back to the differences between earthing and bonding and earthing reduced situation yeah. of water stuff, as you've just explained. Um, it's a very good point uh, that Paul's raised. Um, but as you say... Um, trying to sort out for one scenario only is what we're trying to do. We, we've got to say, we've got, just got to go back to basics mm. all the time. Think about what your basic system is. You've got a basic earthing system from your generator. Remember, the earth on the generator is there for reference. Yeah. It's basically to reference your generator earth to true earth. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's what that's for. And, right, and, and this, this is all we can legislate for single faults. Okay. There was also a question about the earth resistance not exceeding 20 ohms on the earth electrode. Right. And people get confused about this again because, you know, when we're talking about an earth electrode on a generator, remember you can't test that. Unlike an earth electrode on a fixed installation, which you can test with an earth loop impedance tester because you're testing yeah, the earthing through the ground back to the transformer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can, you have the option with a fixed installation earth electrode of testing it either using an earth electrode resistance tester or using an earth loop impedance tester because you have a fixed system with a return path. With a generator, you can't test it using an earth loop impedance tester because there is no path, there is no circle. Yeah, mm. you're looking at just a single rod in the ground. And when you're testing the earth electro resistance, you are testing the resistance of the ground. So when we're yeah. looking at this 20 ohm value, yeah, there's no reason at all why you can't achieve that Yeah, with, a, a, with an earth electrode resistance test. Remember, it's a different test to when we're testing a fixed installation earth electrode. It's right. a totally I'm, different test. I'm going to start going through some of these other questions because... Go on. Um, this we can talk about the earthing and bonding, and I think we're going. I think we need to kind of Do dedicate this sli this slide that you've created for this. Yeah, I think we want to look at um, this. What's this other standard that 
we talked about earlier on. Seven. Yeah, seven four three zero. Three zero. Yeah, right, seven, I want four, to tear three, open oh. a little bit and revisit Earthing and Bonding. We're going to do an Earthing and Bonding. Have we planned that in? Have we pinned it in yet? No, we haven't, but we I can do. We should bring I this mean, into it. As, um, as I said to you, I'd like to continue doing these. Hmm. I mean, even after this pandemic stuff is over, yeah. I, I think these are, are quite useful. And I'd like to get some of the other guys more involved and get maybe get some more people on board. To I'm just give thinking us the in the chat, and then knowledge. I'm going to pop over to some of the questions. And just in the chat, there's mention of obviously SPDs and Lightning. So John O'Neill... If connected to the MET and there's lightning protection on the church, then are the generators going to therefore need surge protection? If you link them together, if they're connected if, and if, if they're connected together, yeah. there is an issue there. Yeah. So, in the unlikely event of a lightning strike, yeah, if you have connected to the electrical or the earthing system of the fixed installation. Okay, uh, in the unlikely the event same, of a, a lightning strike, then you you would probably need surge protection on your supply. Yeah. I shall have a look at sixty three or five and just see if it has anything about but connecting this was, to other this, systems. This is interesting because I mean, just going completely off track here. Remember, we were talking about two three nine six design yeah. verification, and we're looking at the latest round of uh, examiners' reports. Chief examiners. And the chief examiners are saying how people are just totally ignoring surge protection and all sorts of other things. Um, you know, we can't ignore these things. The, the, Paul, the technology is coming Paul in. Scott we need to. <laughs> Hiya. Oh, boy, oh, how are you doing? I'm just, just enjoying. I'm, I'm enjoying this live from the fifth dimension. <laughs> so I'm not yeah. on any part yeah. of the internet. It's like the Matrix. So I'm just enjoying. But can I just add, yeah. if you want answers to any of the questions, so there's a copy of 7430 up here. There's the 16th edition brown, which peaked chapter 54. Never got any better on earthing and bonding. So okay, cool. just as a reference, if you need me to dig out any material to answer some questions. We might, we might get back to some of these questions uh, on another webinar, I think. What we need is a time machine to really stop to time. <laughs> stop time. We need to stop time so that we can actually spend the We were bad at this before, though. We reading. never did. 45 yeah, minutes. The amount of times we said 45 no. minutes. Yeah, I know. So let's get through it. Yes, so... Um, I think I think you're right, uh, John. I'm, I'm going to look at 6305 and says, see if there's any mention about the need for other systems, interconnected systems. But theoretically, yes. Yeah. But I'll, I mean, I'll have a look. On on the subject of surge protection, hmm. yeah. Remembering that, two, uh, 7909 in 2011 stated that we shouldn't be using AC type RCDs hmm. or RCBOs, and yet distro is still being manufactured. With yes. AC type RCBOs. It's most likely distro won't adjust until sparks ask it yeah. to. So on the subject of surge protection, what we need to be doing is if you are specifying or if you are buying new um, distro, talk to the people that are making it and say, look, can you put surge protection in it? Again, I mean, let's remember back at the beginning of this webinar, these systems must be designed to 7671 first and then yeah. 7909 supplements. Yeah. So you design to 7671, you're going to include chapter 44. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get to some questions. Um, cool. And then I promise you, before it's pitch black in your house, <laughs> <laughs> it's getting darker and darker and darker by the minute. Yeah. Maya's cooking dinner at the moment, so I've got this lovely waft of food coming along. And I'm sort of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 no, we're, we're, we're out of time. We're running really, we, we need to get better at this. Okay. Um, so Sean says where crossover of earth things between fixed and temporary, are there any special considerations? I think we've, we've touched onto that one. Uh, Mark says, is the earthing system usually designed as a TT or a TNS when from a generator? Generator is TNS. Yeah, and the reason being that the, the generator, and again, this is a thing that most generators that we use, or generators that we use for fixed, uh, sorry, for temporary installations, because we're providing a, a fairly decent amount of power, there will be a connection within the generator between the actual chassis of the generator and the core of the actual mm. windings and the neutral, which is similar to the actual connection you get on a, on a, a star connected uh, star Delta transformer. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you swung the generator in midair or, or had it elevated on a cushion of air in midair, effectively it's still got its own earth. Mm. Yeah. Um, however, that earth isn't true earth. And the reason we put an earth rod in is to reference the generator earth to true earth. And so then if we've got a number of generators on a site or a, a generators and a fixed installation, all the earths will be referenced to true earth. They're all at the same starting point that will minimize differentials in voltage. Yeah. 
Sorry, I just I laughed because I saw Paul um, Skirms just mentioned. Is there a product standard for the distro? I'm sure I asked this question before about the standards of manufacturing distro. Do you know what I don't? You know, I think I think they just go on Beamer I'm, or something like that. You know? I think there's a general guidance, but I don't think it's got a definitive product standard. I know obviously it's going to be because there's so many different manufacturers and they they make it to mm. their own sort of design. They do. They do customise a lot of it. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll do a little digging, but I don't think there's a stringent... I can uh, ask. I, I know a couple yeah. of manufacturers. I can ask them. I, don't uh, I, know, I know what happened. If we had one, I know what, I know what Paul Scone would do. He'd tear it to, <laughs> tear it to bits. Perhaps it's needed. Yeah. Um, yeah. David Crowley says, during the design using generators, do you need to apply a standard D rating of 0.8? Um... Right, okay, yeah. Well, there's a number of things that we need to consider. Um, generators don't like running at 100%. Hmm. Okay, they don't like running at less than 30%. Less, yeah, you don't want to underrun if, if they run at less than 30%, they tend to coke up because they're not running at sufficient speed to burn all the carbon and stuff like that off. Yeah. So they need to be running, you know, between, you know, 40, 50, 60, up to 70%. If you start running at over 80%, it puts too much stress on them. So we try to run generators somewhere in the middle there. Mm. Of course, that's very difficult because loads are going on and off all the time, and there will be periods of time when you may be running at over 80%. There may be periods of time when you're running at less than 30%, and it's very difficult sometimes on some installations to to a, achieve a, a happy medium. Yeah. But that's that's where we're sort of aiming to be, sort of 50, 60, 70%. Um, so that's the thing with uh, rating of generators. The other thing about temporary systems, obviously, is that because we have this situation of um, things like harmonics, yep. there where we have high neutrals, uh, high neutral currents, yep. uh, we tend to hopefully not push the cables in the distro so far, leaving plenty of headroom. So again, you know, 80% is probably the maximum we want to go to. We always want to have that headroom on top. And then there's also power factor. You know, uh, a lot of people will design the system there are a number of reasons using. to have that that movement, isn't there? Yeah, but a lot of guys will design a system using an 80% uh, 80 or 0 0.8 power factor uh, as a standard. And then once they've done that, they'll then apply the other sort of 80% to the generators and stuff like that. So, yeah, when we install the installations, we should be not anywhere near the yeah. maximum loadings on cables and distro. Okay. Right, Paul's just mentioned this. It's uh, you know the low voltage directive will apply here, so there must be something. Paul, I'm going to take that further in the Discord because I think it's like I'd like to know is if there are particular sense because it helps us, you know, are we, are recommend we talking about, improvement of distro. Are we talking about standard of distro? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I've I know two manufacturers personally. I can talk to them and get mm. get their get their input on it. Shall we say? I'm not saying it'll be totally correct. I'm um, sure we had this discussion before. I'm sure I, I thought so as well. Mr. Skirm's my go-to guy for anything like standards and, and cut markings and things. I'm yeah. sure I've spoken to everyone about this. I'm sure I've I got nowhere with it. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, the temporary electrical uh, system industry, uh, Socapex, Socapex connectors. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Years ago, you know, people were saying about Socapex cables, Socapex connectors, and they quite often quoted a British standard, BSEN, blah, blah, blah. All our Socapex connectors are to this standard. Yeah. All right. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that standard is. It must be something really sort of technical and um, really important on the electrical sort of safety side. And what it was, it was to do with um, the material they were made out of was recyclable. Oh, okay. Absolutely nothing at all to do with electrical safety, nothing to do with electricity. Okay, great. And so this is the sort of thing that makes you start to worry, you know? Yeah. Um, when, when people are quoting this standard and sort of throwing it around as, oh, this, you know, we're very safe and we manufacture everything to BSE mm. and such and such, and then you find out it's to do with, okay, yeah, you can recycle the, the metal. Staying on the subject of soccer packs, uh, Andy's asked this question. And Sean, I'm going to come to your questions. Uh, Andy has said, would every circuit on a 72-way soccer distro need to be checked and recorded? And what items such as like 48-way dimmer racks, what would you do? Uh, with uh, inspection testing of temporary systems, much like an EICR, okay, on a fixed system, uh, we sample. 
So we never test everything 100%. This is obviously when you put it in service on site. Yeah, when you put it in service on site, mm -hmm. okay, we only sample. We, when you consider some of the sizes of some of the installations that we go to, there I mean, is no way. lighting arrangements there are. You'll be yeah. there. You'll, yeah. you'll be There's there no on earth. next year when it comes around again. Nowhere on earth you're going to check everything. Yeah. Now, what I tend to do is I will tend to say to people, remember that PUA Regulation 6 says that all systems should be inspected before mm -hmm. use. So what you do is with the installation team that are putting it in, you say to them, right, guys, as you're laying the cables out, as you're putting the distro together, use your eyes, use your ears, use your nose, okay, a quick inspection as you're laying it out. Okay, so if there's any damaged cables, if there's any sort of nasty smells, anything like that, it should be picked up. And this is a soak effect, so you just look and you can see if any of them have started overheat, you know, Yeah, as well. give, it, give it a sniff, you can smell yeah. it as well. But um, as to the actual physical testing, yeah, we, 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 um, we sample. And, and that is allowed. If you read 7909, it says in there mm. that you sample because 100% inspection and testing is basically unachievable and it isn't necessary. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we sample. So what I tend to do when I'm doing a system is I will do certain tests on certain parts of the system. If I'm going through a dimmer, for instance, um, then obviously things like doing RCD tests and stuff like that are not always possible anyway. Mm. Yeah, great. Um, but obviously when they're between events, they're having their inspection, that would be full? In, like in, between, kind of in between events, they will be checked suitably for the type of equipment. So whatever tests are suitable for that type of equipment will be done. If it's specialist equipment like dimmer racks and stuff like that, then that will be tested. Uh, hopefully it'll be tested by a, a specialist um, firm and not given to any old bod doing a pat test, whacking 500 volts through it. Mm. Because I don't think it'll do it a lot of good. Okay, dokie, great. Uh, okay, Sean has asked... Do installation methods controls mitigate shock risk? So we're asking you to set to allow more or longer current flow on temporary systems. So if we do adjust our systems, is our design or our method mitigating any shock risk? Or if there's a risk of shock, it's just instantaneous disconnection right. at that point. Most electric shocks, most electrical faults are from equipment, which is obviously plugged in and added to the system. Which all is on final, FDU. All final circuits must be protected by a 30 milliamp RCBO or RCD. That's instantaneous. And every final circuit feeding a piece of equipment must be protected by that. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go for this. Let's say I've got a generator to an ISU and yep. I'm gonna run a large cable that does not have instantaneous disconnection. Nope. If there's a risk of shock, I would install it. So let's say for example, I'm going across a road it's got to be a risk of damage, risk of shock. I'm going to have to put in a ramp. I'm going to have to add. If you're going across a road, you've got two options. You are, well, three options. You go underground, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a complete faff. <laughs> because if you go underground, you should actually be using an armored cable. Mm -hmm. You can use HO7 underground, but it's got to go in a conduit, a specialist conduit. Mm -hmm. Okay, not just knifed in and turfed up like we see in some places. Okay, if you go overhead, it needs to be um, three and a half meters high, six meters if it's a vehicle route. Or if you, if the other option is to ramp it, so all your cables need to be protected. Okay, wherever they run, they always need to be run in locations where there is a minimum risk to them. So yeah. your distribution cables, they can't just throw them anywhere. And we had a, we had a situation actually on a on a site some years ago, where somebody had run a cable up a, a, a gantry and through a doorway, and it was a metal door, and the wind caught the door and it sliced the cable in half. Okay, and that wasn't protected by an RCD. Mm. Okay, so yeah, there, there is so, always that risk. But the the reason it happened is because the cable was run where it shouldn't right. be. So yeah. if the cable doesn't have instantaneous disconnection, risk is mitigated with suitable selection and erection, or yeah. just not installed. Yeah, most distribution circuits are protected by a, a selectable RCD with a time delay. Mm -hmm. It's not a requirement. You can have distribution circuits which have no RCD protection yeah. but always make sure the cable is run where it is at least amount of risk at least uh, at least sort of uh, risk of any damage and protect it okay so okay. We, we, we protect we protect it that way and, and mitigate the risk that way okay another question from Sean um, is there a is there any necessity for different RCD types on temporary systems 
Uh, well, <laughs> we've already covered the fact that they should be type A. Type that's what is, starting, that's yeah. what is recommended uh, under 7909. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, a lot of the distro that's been kicking around for a while and is still being made. We still uh, see it, don't we? We still see still AC being made with type AC. Hmm. Um, what can you do about that? Well, very little. Um, the trouble is we never know what's going to be plugged into them. And this is the issue. That's the issue um, we have with 7671, though, isn't it? Just not knowing yeah. the characteristics of the load. I mean, Paul mentioned just the other day, he's, he's heard about, was it a, a coffee machine? Yeah, a coffee machine requiring a type F. Coffee machine requiring a type F. Crumpy. Hey. Imagine, you, you imagine you install some, uh, some FDUs and there's a nice fancy coffee beast, boost, boost, bistro or something. Yeah. And they've got these type F required coffee machines. Gosh. You, you know? more expensive uh, than a type b yeah well it, so, this is the trouble isn't it is the fact that all this stuff is coming in and as equipment is changing as the electronics and all the the actual manufacturer and the techniques of building equipment is changing we're sort of lagging behind on this we really are. uh and be, to be honest bs 709909 was a highlight highlighted this back in 2011 bs 7671 dragged its heels on it you know, it does make you wonder why it took them so long to actually cotton on to the fact that Type AC RCDs are basically as much as a chocolate teapot in, we're, we're, in many we're, cases. Yeah, I mean, this is an industry where a lot of the equipment will be uh, moving uh, more advanced and the RCDs will be Type A, Type B, etc. You know, quite yeah. regularly. Um, but to answer the question, Sean, really... Um, there is a necessity for different RC types, but it's relative to the equipment selected. We may not have that information. Yeah. And the thing is, again, it's one of these things of, um, as far as is reasonably practical, mm. and I always come back to this because sometimes we just need to make a decision and go with it based on our best intentions and our knowledge and experience. And sometimes we can only say as far as is reasonably practical. So if you've got distro, with type A RCDs as required by BS7909, okay, you have done everything as far as is reasonably practical. Mm. Now, obviously, with some types of equipment, they may not be effective, and you may be unlucky enough to get a situation happen where somebody gets a tickle off of something. Um, well, you know, go back to the books and say, well, look, I did everything as far as I could and as far as is reasonably practical. You know, it's not ideal, yeah. but the other option is that we, we start going, you know, with type E and type F, you know. RCDs. Imagine that if you just, I mean, you can't afford to have F as a standard. No. Anyway. No. Um, but, you know, things may change. Things may change over time. Uh, as I say, 7909 does need updating. It's 2011 was the last stab at it, nine years ago. And I think it, there's so much has changed. A lot of change with BS7671. So much has changed. I think they need to be re-looking at it. Mm. I mean, where we are now, we have a starting point of A in 7909. Yeah. And if we have equipment, if you're going to install, let's say you're going to install a stage and there's going to be lighting, there's going to be rigs, whoever's providing that, you should really just request information from them of any equipment that needs a device yeah. that's not A. Uh, yeah. They have, may have no idea how to answer that question. Um, that is the other issue is that people don't know. No, it really is. Okay, uh, right. That's the end of the Q and A. Now the right. chat has gone a little crazy because obviously Paul has started explaining parts of the CE marking, declaration of conformity, uh, pure regulation ten. Then Andy has started to talk about DIN German rules and standards. I'm going to copy and paste that information into the seven nine oh nine section of the Discord server. Right. I think uh, we need to stop this at some point, but I think this conversation needs to carry on. I need to, I want it there for reference. I want everyone to have reference to this information yeah. that we kind of look at. And getting people like Paul Skirm on on the, you know on this kind of uh, you know just journey would be great. Because yeah, it's he, great because he knows at the end of the day, at the end of the day, none of us know it all. Okay, yeah. every day is a school day, and the more people we can get engaged and taking part and offering um, suggestions and solutions and feedback the more we like it. And uh, yeah, the, the, the more it happens, the more we learn. That's what's important. Um, and Sean says, spheres of influence. This is relating to, uh, yeah, okay. 
Uh, we'll do a little bit of looking into how much of a relationship there is with 62305 and 7909 as to how they kind of overlap, if there is any overlap, and then the spheres of influence will be involved with that. Don't be mean. <laughs> we, need to go to, we need to finish. Um, it's like nearly 10 o'clock. Jesus. Is it? My God. <laughs> we will uh, we will we will we will add this though. It's important. It's important information, Sean. So it's you know, don't don't just give up. Bring that question back in the Discord and we'll look for it. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna copy once I close this, the text, I'm gonna copy some of that key information that Paul and Andy have already put in. Now if any of you guys aren't in the Discord, uh, crap. Uh, if you go to my homepage, I think Mike's Mike's put a link on there. A disc, you go to sparkleninja.com, there's a Discord, and then there's like an invite. Um, alternatively, just message me and I'll find a way to get you in there if you wanted to get in there and carry on this conversation under 7909 because we have a dedicated 7909 little jet area um, where this, this scenario that we've just covered was brought up. And, mm. uh, and it's great. It's a great place to kind of hang out. Um, Okie dokie. Uh, 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 anything else? Can you start it? Can... Oi. You just. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching you, watching me, watching you, watching me. It's really weird. <laughs> right, I've, got, I've been up since two a.m. So I'm going to go now. Okay, we are going to We're going to be back on Thursday. We're going to redo the uh, missing test, the ICR missing, missing yeah. tests. Uh, we might expand on it. We might elaborate on it. Um, Again, this is a repeat of a webinar we've done before, just to kind of get Phil and I back in the habit, because clearly we suck at it right now, because we are now at two hours. Although, was that average? I can't remember. Still not beat my record. No, true, right. Yeah, you, you droned on forever. Yeah, Mind you, you it, I found saying. it fascinating what you did. So. Are we going to redo yours? I think we should. No, I think we should. It. Give him no, a beast in. Next week or two, we're going to yeah. continue it. We're going to continue it. Um, Okay, so guys, um, we're also going to do some new ones, uh, talk about literacy, what regulations, talk about this new private rented sector, and we've got, mm. we're going to do one where we're going to look at the 2396 chief examiner, we're going to talk about the problems with the 2396, and we've looked at it, and we've actually found some of the problems, the things we've actually already been approaching in our yeah. enhanced level up style discussions. And it seems to be that there's a lot of the problem with people trying to do 396 because there's a lot of people failing it. And it appears to 70 be that a lot of people, 70%. 70%. The I think the last yeah. round. Last so round gonna, of, we're uh, going to look at that. Um, we're going to talk, talk about why that's happening. We're going to talk about, okay, you know, what can we do to improve that? And we might even look at helping some people start on the 2396 journey. Indeed. Um, all right, Sean's just trolling you now. He thinks you have another hour in you. <laughs> Uh, it was an hour until questions. That's the problem, Terry. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to do what everyone else does. No questions. <laughs> Leave it at that. I think the questions are the best bit. <laughs> yeah, it's the interaction. That's what I like about yeah. this. All right, guys. Uh, yeah. So if some of you come in on Thursday night, great. If not, see you next time we see you. Um, maybe Saturday's a morning one, isn't it? And then we're gonna do some next week. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna put more up. We like doing this. Um, do we? Oh yes, we do. Yes, we do. We do like doing this, do we? I don't know. It's fun. All right, guys. Um, all right, everyone's saying all well, is appreciated. There's no more questions popped up. So, um, any any last words from you, Pop? Uh, yeah, it, as I say, it's, it's turn your light on next time. <laughs> yeah, I've got it's my lights on. Darker, Honestly, darker. I've got my lights on. It has, yeah. No, as I say, none of us know everything, and you know, mm. every day is a school day. And the more of you that get involved, the more questions we get, the more scenarios we look at, the more problems we look at, the more challenges, the more we'll learn. Yeah. And the thing is is yeah sometimes we can over technicalize things and over stuff. always go back to basics that's what i normally do go back to basics and work things through from there uh, as long as we understand our systems work and what we're trying to achieve yeah. then um as i said earlier you know as far as is reasonably practical sometimes we just have to draw a line in the sand and say look that is the best that we can do at the moment with the technology and everything else mm -hmm. that we've got you know we can't we can't actually sort of allow for multiple faults on multiple systems. Um, sometimes we just have to draw a line in the sand. And the main thing is, is not to worry because, you know, most of you guys are really good, knowledgeable, know what you're doing. Uh, just stick with your, your, you know, be confident in what you're up to. But uh, yeah. yeah, so we're, we're back on Thursday. Thursday evening. All right. Okay. So just, 
thanks to everybody for taking part. All right. Cheers, guys. Uh, and yes, Sean, um, Mr. Skirm is a special genius, and we have got special plans for him to come on to the E5 podcast, haven't we? Ah, oh, hey, stick as anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and on his, it's just it's a case of if we're all ready for the level of Mr. Skirm. Yes. That's the problem. Um, you're going to there's leveling up and then there's bite size we want going to work. then there's then there's yeah. so yes but no um we're gonna we've got some great plans um so well yeah anyway, touch your whatsapp one a bit uh all right guys um see ya cheerio take care i gotta ourselves. find the stop button now please do <laughs> here we go bye bye <laughs>